So, Joel Fitzgibbon, thanks for joining Lessons in Leadership. How did you find out that you had got the Defence Portfolio? Were you expecting to get the job? Well, of course, I was the Shadow Minister for Defence for some 12 months prior to the 2007 election. Uh, and so Kevin Rudd had appointed me to the position 12 months out. Uh, and therefore, yeah, I fully expected that I'd remain in the portfolio after the election. But as you know, these things are, are never guaranteed. You can never tell. Did you get um, a handover in any way from your predecessor as minister or was it straight in at the deep end? I don't recall any formal handover, but Brendan Nelson and I were certainly in touch, not irregularly, um, you know, probably in all of the time I was in the portfolio. We had a, a good relationship when I was the shadow minister and he was the minister. And uh, I don't think he'd mind me saying that I'd ring him from time to time when I was the minister, uh, asking for some, some maybe some guidance and uh, drawing on his experience. Sometimes we found that defence was giving funny advice and he would joke, well, I'll tell you what's next. Um, I, that's been certainly the, the conversation I had with Brendan for this series was, was, was learning how to navigate the Defence Department and there's quite a bit to talk about with you in that connection. Mm. But did you start with the game plan? I mean, what did you want to do? What were your priorities as you entered yeah. the portfolio? Yeah, I had a highly defined game plan because I was part of a, a brand new government which had been 11 and a half years in the waiting and we'd made some pretty substantial commitments prior to the election. Our defence white paper was amongst them. We hadn't had one for many years, maybe a decade, I can't recall now. Uh, so I was uh, I was straight into a defence white paper uh, and the Associated Strategic Reform Program because we wanted to find internal savings to redirect them to the capability we were hopeful would be produced by uh, the white paper. And of course, we were, uh, we were in a period of high operational tempo still. So I had a very large focus uh, on Afghanistan. And of course, uh, while we supported our intervention there and certainly supported our troops, uh, we, we had hoped that there might be a, an end to that game at some point. Mm -hmm. I remember, I think, one of your earliest moves was to go to Afghanistan, go to Tarrant Cout, as, as all ministers did, I guess, to, to meet the troops. What did you think of your, well, what did you think your role was in relation to uh, Australia prosecuting a very difficult military campaign, you know, a very long way from our shores? First of I've ought to ensure that the troops uh, knew absolutely and were in no doubt that they had the support of me and, and their government. I think that's always critically important. Uh, second, I, I was particularly perturbed about the NATO strategy in Afghanistan. I thought it was confused uh, and ineffective and uh, lacked strategic uh, focus. And uh, so I went to NATO with in some controversy to, to share my view uh, with members there and to try to give effect to some change. You pushed hard for a seat at the NATO table, which we didn't actually have up until that point. Yeah, I was I was really surprised to learn on becoming minister that you know we weren't even able to access the NATO planning documents. Now it might be that we were getting most of it indirectly through our friends and allies in the United States, but it made no sense to me that we were sending our, our young people potentially to die in the battleground of Afghanistan. And yet we weren't give, being given a seat at the, at the planning table. So I went to first to Regional Command South, which uh, is a body I used to call the uh, caucus of the disaffected. Uh, those countries uh, operating in southern Afghanistan, uh, RC South, uh, Regional Command South, uh, and um, made it very clear to them that at the NATO plenary following I'd be making some noise. And I did make some noise. Uh, a staffer of mine at the time who was in the so-called listening room uh, said that I, I was the only person he ever saw turn the listening room quiet uh, because of the aggressive nature of my intervention on the floor of NATO or the room. Um, and we were successful. The Secretary General in the end intervened and said, you know, he agreed with me that we should have more access to those mm. uh, that decision-making process. I mean, the government was um, clearly supporting our commitment. There was bipartisan support for that. But did you ever entertain private doubts about the wisdom of the operation and what we were actually doing in Afghanistan? All of the time. Um, we had ongoing, we, we were committed to the operations on an ongoing basis, um, but I was really concerned that we weren't in control of our own destiny. 
uh, we were at the hands of uh, NATO, and uh, I was I had real doubts, to be honest, about uh, our capacity to build a government and a democracy uh, in such a failed state. And I think I think I've probably been vindicated in that sense uh, in the period since. It's hard. It's hard to run a, a what started as a reconstruction effort in a province where there had been almost yeah. no construction. Uh, Joel, it seems to me. Well, one of my memories of that time was uh, I, I was uh, involved in defence, uh, supporting almost a monthly statement to the National Security Committee mm. of Cabinet about what it was that we were actually trying to do, trying to shape a policy. And that makes me think that, of course, you had in um, Kevin Rudd, a, a Prime Minister, very strategically focused, a, a guy who had been sort of steeped in international security stuff. Mm. How did you manage your relationship with him uh, over the course of your time as Minister? Interestingly, I've been asked that question many times. Uh, people uh, took the view, unsurprisingly, that it would be potentially difficult to be Kevin's Defence Minister or indeed Foreign Minister because he was uh, so invested uh, in those subject matters. But actually, he gave me a very high level of independence. Uh, in, you know, he was really more focused on the domestic issues that matter at the time of the next election. Mm. They, they're my words, not his. Mm. That was my perception uh, of his thinking. So obviously, you know, things like education, industrial relations, whatever it may have been were his areas of interest. He had a focus on domestic politics. So I had a high degree of independence. Now, having said that, I think Kevin's one of those people you, who, uh, who are easy to read. And I think that uh, almost robotically, uh, I always acted in a way which I thought would be consistent with his think, thinking in any case. Mm. But we never had, I don't ever remember us having a disagreement uh, on policy in, in the defence sphere. Including on Afghanistan in particular? Or? Yeah, I think, we, I think we both understood or agreed that um, the strategy was flawed and the prospects of success were poor. Um, never a disagreement about that, and we, you know, when we moved to that, that, made that transition to the training of the Afghan National Army and Afghan National Police, then we were both, you know, we were both of the view that it was time to start looking for a way of transitioning out. But in doing, you know, in doing so, uh, not deserting the task we'd set for ourselves. Mm. Um, uh, of course, the other big strategy uh, piece at the time was the, the uh, decision to produce a new defence white paper mm. that finally came out in 2009. Uh, these things take a while to produce. What was your memory of um, steering that process? Busy. Yep. Um, you know, along with the strategic reform program, it took up an inordinate amount of my time. It was punishing, uh, actually. I, I, I very vividly remember, maybe unfairly, uh, bringing... Uh, the team together, when I say the team, the broader team, including, uh, you know, the CDF, the secretary and others together. I think it was on Father's Day. It was one of those particular days, um, dragging them all in because uh, I was concerned about time slippage and whether, uh, we were on track to deliver, um, as quickly as I, was, was my expectations. Although now I say that, I'm just wondering if that was the strategic reform program, actually, but certainly together they kept the two, me. The two were sort of yeah, they were the intertwined. intertwined. Yeah, same thing, really. Did you feel in control of the process? Yeah, I did. I felt quite comfortable with it. Um, we had Mike Pizzullo as the key author, but you might recall that I established an independent uh, advisory panel um, who I met with uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and at no point uh, did I feel any need to you know, bring Mike Pizzullo in, for example, or the CDF or the Secretary and say, look, I'm really concerned that we're not on track uh, here. I think we were, we were all of co common mind at the time. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about, um, you know, one of the big decisions that came out in that white paper was the decision to uh, grow the size of the submarine fleet from mm. the six uh, Collins class that we had then mm. and still have now mm. to 12 future submarines. As, as these things go, that's a, that's a big decision. What, what was the, the, sort of the origins of that particular thought? Uh, that's one area where Kevin did have a lot of influence. Uh, Kevin Rudd was very determined to substantially expand the, 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 the underwater fleet. Um, I agreed, obviously, if you're going to um, increase your force protection, projection and protection, you, your submarines were going to be a very big part of the project. Uh, I was concerned about uh, the success or well, historic success of Australian builds, um, whether that would become, well, something unsuccessful would become my, my legacy. In other words, trying to chew up too much 
And I was particularly concerned about the capacity to man the submarines. It's great to have them, um, but you've got to man them. And at the time, of course, we were struggling to man the Collins class. Uh, so I had my concerns, but strategically, I thought it was absolutely the right decision. Did you have any thoughts or have any discussions at the time about whether or not these boats, the future boats, could be or should be nuclear powered? Uh, well, again, having said that Kevin didn't intervene much, um, <laughs> this is the second example now of Kevin absolutely intervening. Kevin made it quite clear that he didn't, uh, he wanted sub nuclear submarines ruled out uh, early. And my memory is that that wasn't of very much concern to the CDF and others because I, don't, I think there was a general view that, that we weren't capable of going into that game in any case, particularly given we don't have a nuclear, a civil nuclear mm. uh, industry here in Australia. So it wasn't something I tossed and turned over. How, how about thinking about it now, John? I mean, do you think that was the right well, call? Yeah, well, I did say publicly somewhere along the track uh, well, after I left Defence, yeah. I thought it was. It, it, I, I thought then, and still do now, uh, it was a mistake uh, to rule it out. And I do wonder, looking back now, whether Kevin uh, had his eye on domestic politics and the adverse, you know, the resistance in this country to anything uh, that is nuclear. Mm. Um, I haven't asked him, uh, but I suspect that might have been part of his thinking. And uh, I mean, and, and, and that should not have been part of our capability thinking. What. You know, domestic views about nuclear, yes. in particular nu nuclear generation, should not have fed, if it did, should not have had fed into our decisions on capability. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, it didn't fall to you, or, or indeed um, a few ministers after you, to decide on uh, the submarine type. But no. were you always of the view that it was inevitably had to be constructed in Australia? My public view or private view? I'd give us both. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, only, I'll only give you one. Look, I, I, I was always and remain really concerned about Australian bills. Yeah. Now, we do have a very specific specific capability need. Uh, and I don't know whether uh, today you, you could find that capability off the shelf anywhere else in the world. I suspect you still can't. Mm. But maybe you could find something with limited, uh, requiring mi limited modification. But look, I'm of the view that uh, defence is our first priority. And if you want to create jobs in South Australia or somewhere else, uh, we'll take the premium you're uh, using to, uh, to fund the Australian build, you know, build a bridge or a freeway or, or something else that creates just as many jobs. Reminding, keeping in mind, of course, you need to maintain a repair and maintenance you know, capability here in Australia. So that's another complication. Yeah. But gee, uh, it looks to me like the submarine program is going very badly. It's going to be very expensive. And I'm really concerned about the capability, Cameron. Mm -hmm. um, an area of uh, capability that um, we, we sort of gave up the idea of local construction in the early 80s was, was combat aircraft. Mm -hmm. And um, in your time as minister, you had you dealt with the department over the acquisition of the Joint Strike Fighter. And you, you were fairly critical, um, at least after uh, leaving office, about how you felt uh, defence was sort of engaging with you on that. Yeah. Um, what, what are your sort of memories of that issue? Yeah, my memories are a bit vague now. I, and I do recall saying something very strong sometime after I left. And I don't remember what precipitated that now, what context that was done in. Well, this, this was the context, Joel, of just the time frame of when would we actually see yeah. the aircraft delivered. Yeah, yeah. And, and you recall uh, when uh, Brendan Nelson became uh, Minister of, um, a little bit further down the track, he, he actually... Um, uh, pushed on to defence the, the Super Hornet acquisition, mm, mm. which was to acknowledge that there was actually going to be a gap between the classic mm. Hornets and mm. the arrival of the mm. Joint Strike Fighter. And the department had sort of fought that vigorously right up until the point that Brendan yeah. said, no, no, you've got to do it. Mm. And I think you were sort of there in the early stages of that. Discussion. I was, yeah. yeah. And, and interestingly, I was the minister to, which took the proposition to the NSC to have them wide as growlers. Yep. Uh, which was uh, which was not easy. There was a lot of pushback mm -hmm. against that uh, at the time. Um, but look, I think my concern about the JSF wasn't it wasn't around capability ever. Uh, I never had any doubts about the capability. It was always the delivery time uh, and the cost and a feeling that um, we were not being paid by our American allies, but certainly weren't in any way in control of our own destiny. And you might recall that, you know, I started a conversation of uh, showing interest in the F-22 Raptor, mm. mainly as a way of putting some competition 
uh, into the environment so we weren't just so so wedded to one project um, and were, if you like, price takers, capability takers. We just didn't, I didn't feel we had any control uh, over the project. And I could see delays coming and coming and coming. And I think I probably were vindicated on that as well. But I also knew in, in my heart of hearts that, you know, the JSF was always going to be the only choice available to us and, and would deliver us the best capability. Um, Defence swamps ministers with paperwork, um, mm. never more so than in the capability area where, you know, NSCs take packs sort of that thick into the mm. into the to the decision making table. Um, talk about the workload of the department. How did you find that? Um, what sort of impact did it have on you, on, on your home life? Did you have a home life while you were minister? Or? No, I didn't have much of a home life. Uh, it was the most punishing job I've ever undertaken. Really? And I remember very vividly flying to uh, Tokyo with Stephen Smith on the VIP. Was it two plus two, it's called, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. And, and so somehow we got, uh, he must have yeah, made an under the breath complaint about the, the number of submissions uh, he was receiving and the workload. And I'll make up the numbers, but I don't, because I don't remember them. But, you know, I said, well, how many submissions did you get in the last calendar year? And he said, oh, 3,000. And I said, well, I had 6,000. And he didn't believe me. Yeah. And uh, we had, had, right I had to get someone on the, else on the plane, might have been the CDF, to verify what I'd said. And he was just gobsmacked. And, and sometimes you have those uh, moments where you, you ask yourself, is this yes, Minister? <laughs> is this being done to me deliberately? Um, because they, they were not only numerous in number, but they were, they were often very weighty uh, as well. And um, that, that, that in itself was punishing. The, the workload was horrendous. Um, I'm sure that's always true, but in a time of high operational tempo and when you're doing a white paper and a strategic reform program all at once and trying to get yourself known, do the media and do the other things you do as a minister, then it's, you know, it's pretty tough going. Does um, having a junior minister help or, or not in that context? Yeah, I, I, I can never really decide. Uh, sometimes I say this with the greatest respect to those who are my colleagues and they sort of get in the way, you're managing the distribution of work and, you know, dealing with people who might want to do a bit more and then you, you're you always reluctant to, well, like certainly I'm the sort of person uh, who which is reluctant to let things go too much, bit of a control freak, some might say, maybe, but, um, yeah, I've, yeah, many people have many thoughts about how we should design that portfolio, whether you have separate service ministers, etc. cetera. Um, Certainly, one person has to be ultimately responsible, and that being the case, then none of it really helps much. Yes, yes. Let's talk about your relationship with the department, because it, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Yeah. Um, how did it start out? Um, how, did, how did you try to structure what you wanted mm. to get from the secretary and the CDF mm. and all the others that were mm. surrounding them? Yeah, I think it's, uh, well, from my perspective, it's a bit of a myth that the, the relationship wasn't good. Um, Others might say differently, but I, I think they'd agree it was good most of the time. We were never, if you like, at war with one another. But from time to time, things popped up, which caused tension between other me and the, the CDF or uh, me and uh, the secretary. And that happened uh, more than once. But uh, I thought the relationship was a pretty good one. There was um, an issue that did uh, push into the sort of public sphere in a way that I guess many, many wouldn't, and that was around allegations that surfaced in the press that the department, uh, particularly the, um, the Australian Signals Director, was mm. actually spying on you. Yeah, that was overblown too. Um, I, I never, I don't recall ever bringing the CDF or Secretary in and saying, is this true, or really focusing on that. I thought it was almost humorous. Yes. Um, I mean, the Attorney General at the time Robin McClelland uh, was very quick to come out at the time and say, well, Asia doesn't have any interest in Helen Liu, the person who was the subject of that controversy. Uh, by the way, Fairfax paid me very handsomely for uh, those stories, uh, which were founded on basic untruths. So I, I never really took too much notice. I was just so busy, I took too, too. I was far more concerned about what was running in the media than yes. I, what I thought might have been happening uh, internally. Um, so did, did you have um, uh, a sort of a trusting relationship, the kind of relationship you wanted with senior people in the department? Yeah, I think I, think I did. But, but I was also conscious um, 
that, you know, senior people in defence had regular meetings wondering and working out how they might deal with the minister. But mm. I think that's pretty standard for, for any minister. You'd know better mm. than me, Peter. Mm. Um, minister management. Yeah, yeah so, um, you know, I, you know I, I didn't think there was ever anything extraordinary. I remember having a very, um, I thought, unfortunate mishap with uh, Angus Houston one day because I'd had a, I'd had a conversation with Peter McFedrin at the Telegraph about, I think it was about fast jets, um, and I think it was, I know the subject, it was about the availability of F-18s in Afghanistan where they had the necessary self-protection measures, and I thought I was having an off-the-record, uh, I, I thought I'd made an off-the-record comment. Mm -hmm. uh, he took it as an on-the-record comment, whatever it was, and printed it, and Angus wasn't too happy about that, and I think he was entitled not to be happy, and I hadn't intended to be a public comment. So, yeah, we had problems like that uh, from time to time. I recall um, having a... I might not get this exactly right, it's a long time ago, but they were trying to put some self-protection on a Blackhawk and they were asking me to take a, a submission to NSC proposing to spend this fairly significant amount of money uh, fitting this kit to the Blackhawks and it was only going to be a pilot, it was going to be on one Blackhawk, maybe two Blackhawks and the submission just didn't make any sense to me. I just couldn't, I would never go into the NSC selling a submission which I didn't feel I fully understood myself. And in the end, I looked at one of them and he just didn't think of it. I said, we're never going to use this, are we? And to their great credit, someone said, no, Minister. So as I remember, they, they had bought this capability for the, the Hornets because the Americans at that point were denying us their self-protection right. capability. Um, so they bought this kit. The Americans changed their minds. We fitted the American kit to the to the uh, FA-18s and um, rather than admit that we had this being surplus to our needs, they decided they were going to try to put it on the back horse. But it, it seemed no one ever believed it was ever going to happen, but they were still going to proceed with the pilot. And there was a lot of money and um, I give myself a bit of credit for sort of working that one out. Um, the series that we're producing is called Lessons in Leadership. But what, what, what does it mean to be leading a defence organisation if you're minister? What, what is the type of leadership we're talking about? Well, it's a heavy responsibility, uh, an important job, uh, and it's such a big and complex organisation. Yeah, you cannot do it without a good relationship with uh, with the leadership over in Russell. And I was always very uh, conscious of that, and that's why, you know, I don't believe that my relationship was uh, a poor one or one which wasn't um, conducive to, to good outcomes. But you've got to trust your leadership. That's, mm. I suppose that's the challenge mm. because um, as a minister, um, as much as some might like to think otherwise, you, you, are, you are heavily reliant on advice and guidance. So you've got to be strong and, and challenging, I suppose. I mean, it's a minor example, but the, the Blackhawk kids an example. I mean, good ministers aren't people who are... You know, the, a great treasurer is not the expert in the, in the economy. A great health minister is not a, an expert in health policy. Uh, a good minister is someone who's able to listen to competing advice and instinctively make a judgment about which is the right advice. So you've got to work with, you've got to be strong and forthright and, and make it clear that that um, you're on your game, mm. but at the same time you've got to maintain that good relationship and follow it. Follow good advice. It's a sort of constructive scepticism, I think, isn't it? I mean, you can't you have just to. take at first value anything that comes to you. And well, you know, I recall, you know, there's a culture on Russell too that um, isn't always um, A+. Plus. And I remember someone saying to me, uh, one day we're having a sort of budget conversation looking for savings and, and uh, I pulled them up on what they thought was a minor point as we we're going through uh, the list. And... Someone in the room said, oh, Minister, it's, it's $300 million, it's rats and mice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, don't you ever say that in front of any of my cabinet colleagues. Yeah. I mean, $300 million is not rats and mice. I mean, the context of the defence budget, it's not a big outlay, but it's still a big uh, amount of money. Yeah. So there are cultural issues to overcome. That's interesting. Looking back over your time, what, what would you regard as the sort of high points or things that you're most pleased that you did as Minister? Um, obviously, the production of the white paper took a lot of work and thought and energy, and I thought it was a good white paper, and I, I think it was broadly well received uh, at the time. But the strategic reform program was important to me as well because you know I could see that looking forward, 
we were going to need a lot more money invested in capability uh, and the resources for our troops. And I knew that money wasn't going to be coming from the centre. Mm -hmm. And we had to find money internally. And, you know, we were making some tough decisions. Uh, thankfully, I was able to say to uh, our troops that look, every money, um, every cent saved will be reinvested in defence, which helped politically. Um, but it, I think that was a, an achievement. Uh, I, it's probably not important in the broader scheme of things, but I, I thought staring NATO down was a, a rather courageous thing to do and an important thing to do and one I'm very proud of. There's a great cartoon on my office wall which depicts an Australian tank going up to the head, NATO headquarters with the Australian flag and two European types looking out from the first floor window and one asked the other, what's got into the Aussies? And the other responded, regime change. <laughs> Well, and I think that's lasting, job because I, I cannot imagine that we would deploy, you know, in a big way as part of a coalition mm. operation and not insist on a seat at the table for the for the mm. big strategic... Well, I'll tell you how that came home to me at first. Yeah. I, I was travelling to my first NATO meeting and uh, asked for the, the papers, the planning documents, well in advance so I could study them fully before I even left the country. And I might, might have been the CDF looked me in the eye and said, oh, no, Minister, I'm sorry, we, we don't have access mm. to those documents. Mm. Amazing. Um, conversely, uh, low points, things that you felt unhappy about or dissatisfied about? I look, having said I thought I had a good relationship, it seemed a constant battle. And I remember I used to come back from question time when Parliament was sitting and ask the obvious question, what crisis awaits me now? And my, my staff would inevitably say, it's funny you ask that, Minister. <laughs> um, and, you know, up to three briefs would come out with some, uh, some sort of crisis. But that's inevitable when you're, when you're driving change. In hindsight, we might have been in too big a hurry, um, might have taken on too much too quickly. Um, but I still have no regrets uh, on, on that point. Uh, a low point was the SAS pay debacle, uh, so an issue I understood very, very well. And, you know, I'd asked Defence to stop docking the pays, at least until we got across the issue and found a way of sorting it out in a better way. But Defence just kept deducting uh, the pays, which made me look pretty silly. So so there, um, the, the story is about how a crisis can move from sort of an administrative problem mm. and, and grow into becoming a much bigger media Sort of public relations problem. Yeah. That, that was a good example of that. Yeah. How do you um, try to find some way to to put yourself back in control when you're in the middle of a really bad media situation? I think the answer uh, to that is to be careful not to get too deep in in the first place. Right. You know, I was a relatively, still a relatively new and energetic and keen minister, uh, very, very determined to have the confidence uh, of the people in the services. Um, one of them to know I always had their back. I've had good feedback about my trips to Afghanistan in particular, where I spoke to the uh, special forces people privately and you know and heard that I they they were aware that I'd gone back to Australia and raised their concerns and maybe fixed their concerns. And when I when I heard about the pay docking thing, I was very determined to, for the special forces guys to know that we were on their side and we weren't going to do the wrong thing by them. Mm. And I jumped in. Um, I should have sat back and just let the administrative process uh, work it out and let CDF and others uh, do their better. At least, at least until it came, it became a crisis. I think I got myself too involved, too yeah. deeply, too quickly. That's interesting. Um, of course, uh, you resigned from the job, not really for a defence-related issue, but mm. I guess that implies that you left not necessarily feeling happy about that circumstance. I mean, as you look back on it, what are your regrets about how the, the job came to an end? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, in the end, resigned over a very minor matter. Um, I'd made a mistake, and I admit that. Uh, my brother had come to me, and he's a CEO of NIP Health Funds, um, the largest public listed private health insurer still, I think, and said, look, you're driving this saving program. He said, you know, in the US, they privatise defence health. You can save a lot of money. Uh, so there's no proposal to do this. Mm. He asked me whether... Uh, I was able to get him the information he'd need to do due diligence to make a presentation to Defence about how that would work, how it works in the United States. So there was no contract or tender or even a government proposal to privatise health. And I thought that was a very innocent thing to do. 
but in hindsight, and with more experience now, it was a stupid thing to do. I should have realised it was my brother asking the question and that might have presented a perception of inappropriate behaviour and I should have just said, well, sorry, mate. A shame because if you were someone else, I could probably do it, but because you're my brother, uh, I shouldn't, or I should have, um, you know, gone through the process of writing to the Prime Minister and asking another cabinet level minister to look at it, but it just seemed very innocent to me at the time because there were no proposals, but in, in you know, in retrospect, it was a stupid thing to do. And, and of course, I'd lost a lot of capital by then over the Helen Lou right. matter. Um, which was just ridiculous. I mean, this idea that Helen Liu was some sort of an agent of the a foreign government, to me, was just um, ha having known her well, just, I mean, this is a woman who'd never even asked me about my work or the relationship between the two countries. It just didn't seem to be her you know, space of interest, and I still believe that. Um, but I became victim to a battle between her and her former partner mm -hmm. that got very ugly, and I was used as a vehicle, and I was collateral damage. Uh, but because people were being, were prepared to write things that were just well, because her enemy was prepared to present just untrue um, stories to, uh, to mainly to get at her, it's, it's it's very hard to prove them to be untrue when they're so untrue. There's no evidence to, to prove them untrue either. So I just got caught in that pincer. By the time the uh, the actual matter that caused my resignation came along, I was running pretty low on political capital. Right. Could you have toughed it out? I mean, not too many ministers resign these days, at least. Yeah, well, uh, on today's standard, yeah. I should have absolutely toughed it out. Yeah. Um, but I think at the time, you know, I was so physically and emotionally exhausted uh, and so, so tired of uh, fighting it that because the, the, the Lou matter in particular dragged on for months and so it came, came back again because uh, this guy kept fueling uh, the media stories. Um, and again, how do you how do you prove to be untrue? Uh, so something that just never had any basis, in fact, anyway. So well, I think that I got to a point that where um, while resigning wasn't uh, my first choice, it seemed a bit of an easy choice too at the time. Um, Joel, what? Oh, no, I should I should say there um, that I, I, having gone back to the ministerial code of conduct, um, I was no doubt uh, that I was technically in breach of the ministerial code of conduct over the health matter. And I wasn't prepared to ask my Prime Minister to go into the into question time uh, and argue that I wasn't. Um, now, I thought that was the right thing to do, and I think today that's the right thing to do, but it's uh, yes. rarely, rarely um, an attitude that is followed in modern politics. What's emerging from these conversations, I think, is just the toughness of the job. Uh, listening to West Australian uh, ministers and the travel regime and the small amount of time they can get to spend with family. I mean, this is one of the hardest jobs the Commonwealth asks people to undertake. Can you think of anything that, that could or should be done to make the position of defence ministers sort of more doable, more survivable? No. no? I, I've given that a, a lot of thought over many years and you know, people like Neil James, for example, have strong views on uh, rearranging the ministerial arrangements. But, you know, I, I think if I was defence minister, uh, again, I'd want to be in charge. I'd want the buck to stop with me. And if that's your first desire, then you're going to have to take the work on yourself. And um, I remember people, friends would say to me after I left defence, gee, look, you're looking good. You look terrible when you were defence minister. And I said, "Well, why didn't you tell me that then?" <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it, I used to call it um, sweet and sour. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's an amazing job you do. You have the opportunity to do it, some amazing things, um, particularly in areas of operation. But uh, it's sour in the sense that it's so punishingly hard, and you do find yourself fighting defence a lot of the time. Mm. What advice would you have for someone who is stepping into the job? Uh, know your know your subject very well. Um, advice is very important. Guidance is very important. You're absolutely dependent on it, but um, be well educated, self educated yourself on on all matters. Uh, to try to pace yourself, I probably didn't pace myself that well. Uh, try not to get too immersed where you don't need to be immersed. Special forces soldiers pay. Was an example where I could have just let the uh, the issue 
uh, run uh, a little more and you know maintain that good relationship that challenge um, defense leadership but maintain that good relationship because you'll need it well john thanks for joining us a pleasure thank you okay.